joining. Romans 6. Romans 6. That's where we will be this morning and next week. Um, there's a few things. Last week, we I, I challenged us all, really, uh, as we ended up Joshua, to live a life of faithfulness. And what would be said? What would be our legacy? Uh, I received a lot of messages. I, um, it's something for all of us to think about. Uh, this past week, and as I began to think about that, there's this rub of how are we going to live uh, the Christian life as we still battle with certain things, but also we, we, we want to do what's right, we want to live for Christ, but how do we do that when I still struggle over here? How do we see, uh, and we saw with Israel as, as well, and Joshua, as they had moments of ups, they had moments of down. They still had this struggle, this pool, as Joshua was telling them that stay away from those idols, stay away from those old pagan gods that you worshiped before, that your, your generations before you worshiped. Stay away from all that. Pursue God. Live for Him. That's, that's the rub of most of Joshua. That's what we talked about last week. So as we do so, and as we bring that truth into a more modern setting that we are living in, we find... Nothing new is really under the sun. We still battle with sin. We still battle with the struggles. We still battle with those idols that try to pull us away. So how do we navigate all of these things? How do we deal with sin? How do we, we say no to it? What should we do with it? Should we just turn a blind eye? Uh, and I think you guys know that it's a no. But, but what should we make of this battle that rages in the Christian life? And Romans 6 uh, is a perfect starting point for us. And I, I titled it, I posted something this week about gospel living. This is what it means to live out the gospel every single day. And over the next, really the month of July, we're going to look at what does that mean? How, how do we navigate life as we try to live out our, our faith, this Christian faith that we claim to believe, that, that we claim to be uh, as Christians transformed by, as we, we, we are all in that process of sanctification that I've spoken about many, many times as we seek to be more like Christ, how do we deal with that remaining sin problem that we have? Because we know we're made new in Christ, but we still struggle. So what's the rub? How do we balance all of that? I believe Paul, as we jump in here, has some answers for us this week as we dive into Romans chapter 6. So first, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Alright, so look there with me. Romans 6, 1 through 2, Christians are no longer defined by sin. Here, here's what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? All right. Now, I know we're jumping right in here. We're, we're jumping into chapter 6. But it's clear Paul was trying to deal and address with some issues that had come up in that early church. For many, the church had been started uh, and had been going for many months, years now. And Paul is hitting it, and he's coming back, and he would go on his missionary journeys, and he'd visit these churches, and then he'd go visit another church, and then he would try to come back to these churches to see how they were doing and see how they were getting along. And some things had then come clear to him as he realized people were struggling and dealing with this whole sin issue. It, it's obvious they were making excuses for their sin. They were trying to justify their sin. They knew they were Christians, so they were using that as an excuse to say that my grace may abound. They're saying, no, I'm, I'm covered by grace. It's like, if we put that in modern terms, it's like us saying, well, it's okay if I lie a little because I, I know God will forgive me. How many times have we said something like that? Or it's like we would say, well, it's okay to gossip or slander a little because I, I know God will forgive me. And then it escalates quickly. It's, it's okay to uh, cover, I'll say myself, that fishing boat my neighbor has, right? Uh, because I know God will forgive me for doing that. Because I don't really want it, but I, I would take it because it's really nice, right? 
We try to justify our sin in our minds. Or it can escalate even further. It's okay if I, 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 I cheat on my, my, my spouse over here for a little while because I know God will forgive me and she'll forgive me and all these things. He'll forgive me. All these things. We try to escalate. We say, we try to justify that grace may abound. No. What's Paul saying? By no means. By no means. Literally, may it never be. We don't do that as Christians. You and I have no grounds to justify any sin. You and I have nothing that we can stand on to say, it's okay if I sin. I, I know Jesus will forgive me. And he will. I, I will say that. He will. But you see the argument that Paul's making. We don't use that as an excuse to justify our sin. Sin should no longer be what defines the Christian. So what should? Uh, in Colossians, it says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You and I, if you're a Christian today, now belong to Christ. We are His. He is ours. You and I are to seek the things that are above. A few weeks ago, and we live this out every day, don't we? We, 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 we are defined by what, how we live our lives, and people know us by how we live our lives. A few weeks ago, Zach's sitting over here. I could see it. I was watching him, and I'm there's always something going on. I'm trying to keep a straight face, but there's always something. He's turned around looking at Cody, and he keeps turning around. I'm like, what in the world is going on here? He keeps turning around looking at him. And afterwards, Cody comes over and he tells me, you know what was going on there? And I'm like, no. Well, Cody was one of my assistants for T-ball, and for something, for some reason, uh, on that particular Sunday after the season's almost over, Zach turns around and he's like, coach? You? <laughs> Cody's like, yeah, bud. We've been doing this for like two months now, right? And so, Zach, he knows, Cody, that he put the two together, and he goes, oh, you're my coach. That's right. I know you now. And he, you know, he likes the big trucks and cars and tractors and all that stuff. He, he loves that stuff. We're defined by how people view us, how they see us. And in this Christian life, if we are going to embrace a life of sin... And say that we're, we're not going to seek the things above. We're going to seek the things that are heard on earth. We're going to say, well, grace may abound. We're, we're going to say and try to justify our sins. That's how people are going to view what a Christian is. That's what Paul said. May it never be. By no means. As Christians, we seek the things that are above. We seek the things that are of Christ. As Christians... That is what should be defining in our lives. So when others see us and others say, well, what is Christianity all about? When they look at our lives, are they going to see someone who is devoted to someone who is greater, someone who is mightier, someone who paid the price of the cross for their sins, King Jesus? Or are they going to see someone who is a, and you've heard it all, well, Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. And the truth is, we are. A lot of times, we truly are. The difference is, is that we know who the one that will forgive us, and that is Christ. We're not trying to justify our sins. We're trying to take them, nail them to the cross, and say, Jesus has forgiven me. I'm not going to try and do those things. I'm not going to seek those earthly things any longer. I'm going to seek the things that are above, the things that are of Christ. So that should make us ask some pretty hard questions. Here they are. Do I try and justify my sin? And, and I think we all would maybe be guilty of that a little bit. Then that leads to the second one. Does sin define my life? Am, am I captured? Am I, am I engulfed by that sin? Do I rightly understand God's grace and use that as motivation to repent? I don't use it as justification to sin. No, I use it and realize, well, God is gracious. And if I sin, I'm going to go to him, make it right, and repent and change and not desire to do any of that any longer. And 
how can I change to better reflect my Savior? It's sweet. It's, it's hard questions. We must ask, but from time to time, we must ask these questions to evaluate our lives and how our commitment and pursuit of godliness really is. These are hard, hard questions, but we can, by the grace of God, be successful in our pursuit of Christ's likeness. Second, verses 3 through 11. Here's what Paul says. Christians are united to Christ. So verse 3, he says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin, alive to God. Now there's a lot of things he deals with here, and there's some pretty weighty theological truths as well, but I'm going to hit on a few of them uh, because it helps our understanding. But the first one is this. Uh, there's this concept of baptism he addresses here, and uh, we are united in Christ in baptism. That's literally what he says. We are we're buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So what is he getting at? Because first thing, I, I want to clarify a few things. First thing is this. Baptism does not save anyone. I, I make that very clear. We, we find that nowhere in Scripture. There is no support in Scripture that baptism saves anyone. In fact, if you look at Ephesians 2.8.9, this verse is so important for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, which baptism would be. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, which baptism would be. So that no one may boast. We, we, baptism does not save. We cannot save ourselves. So what is Paul talking about here? The scriptures speak of both water baptism and then what's called a spiritual baptism. Uh, and there's a dual reality that we find. And it can be tricky as we try to navigate the scriptures and see the difference. But here, what we find is a, a reference to... The, the spiritual side of baptism, what happens when we are converted, when we believe and we repent of our sins and the, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and enters our life and gives us newness of life. This is what it, uh, Paul is getting at here. We, we are united to Christ in several different things at this moment. And specifically, uh, there are three, his death, his burial, his resurrection. So his death, we are united with him. What's that mean? Just as Christ died for the punishment of sins, we are putting to death the old life that was marked by sin as well. Now, the second step, we his burial. Uh, as he was buried, we too, our old selves, are done away with. That we're not about that old self anymore. We're, we're saying, no, I, I, I'm done being marked by sin. I'm done living for King Justin. I'm ready to live for King Jesus. That is going to mark my life now. And as I put those things to death, we find his resurrection. Our new life is defined by Christ. That's why we live for him. We're all about King Jesus now. We have been given newness of life. Because we've been given newness of life, this is why Paul in Ephesians, Colossians, some other passages says we put away the old self, but we put on the new self that is like Jesus. And rest assured, look, look at verse 5. 
your new identity in Christ is of utmost importance and it will offer hope. And verse 5, it, it, it's a reference to the hope that we are, because we are united in him, we can face this sin battle. We can face what rages before us. We can face what is coming before us. It means that even though I wrestle with this sin, and in the past I, I, I didn't win, I, I gave in to my sin, I can now have victory because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, I too can have victory in my fight against sin. And I realize that the battle can be hard. Um, this war rages, uh, and it can be very, very difficult. Our, our battles with sin, the vices we have, can be these little idols that we, we put up in our lives. It can be super hard to battle and rage against. But rest assured, I, and I know it can feel overwhelming, but rest assured, Christ says you can have victory. As he had victory, we are united with Christ, we too can have victory over these things as well, over these sins, these battles, these wars that go on in our lives. We too can have victory over them as well. But as we start seeing in verse 6, you, you have to ask yourself some hard questions. The first one is this. Am I truly a Christian or not? Uh, has my life been, been radically transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have I given myself fully to Christ? Have I repented of my sins? Have I, have I said, Jesus, you are Lord, and I know you are Lord, and now I'm going to live for you, Lord. I'm going to live for you, Jesus. You will rule my life. I am yours. Use me as you desire. Have you done that? And then second, if you have, you must Put your sin to death. Your old self, your old self has died with Christ, as we see in this in this in this passage in verses five and six. Even the old, even though the old self has been nailed to the cross, we still wrestle with the temptations of the flesh, and this is what Paul is getting at in this passage. The flesh doesn't have to. And we find that victory in Jesus. It used to win. And we used to be enslaved by it. We had no other choice. We gave into it constantly. And now, because you belong to Jesus, you can have victory in this life. You are free in Christ. Sin no longer has dominion or control over you. I, I view it like this. And some of you may have seen... Um, I'm hoping Lord of the Rings, a uh, great movie, it's worth your time. But there's a there's a picture there um, that is that's fascinating. And here's the picture. You kind of, kids might be creeped out. They're not there. You kind of a creepy guy over here. Both of them right now. All right. This is King uh, Theoden. This is uh, Worm Tongue. Uh, Theoden is the king of Rohan. Uh, he is the ruler over all that land. And Worm Tongue has gotten in his ear. And he, he's kind of he's kind of mesmerized him and taught him things. And now uh, Theoden is just a, a shell of what he used to be. And he's, you can kind of see in his eyes. He's almost blinded by this uh, spell or whatever that's over him. And as you as I as I've watched this show, it's a perfect illustration of how sin can be blinding, can be crippling. Theoden was nothing as he was being led astray by worm tongue. And in our lives, that's exactly how sin acts. Sin can be blinding. And we, we can take a little a little grip, and it's like I, I tell the kids a lot. If I have one cup of ice cream, I'm going to want the whole container, right? And that's how sin often is. Is we'll take one little sip. We'll say, wow, that's okay. I, I can do this one time. And then all of a sudden, this is spiral that keeps going down and down and down. And I'm engulfed in this sin battle that I didn't even realize was happening. And all of a sudden, I'm blinded by it. I can't see it. I'm just a, a shell of what I once was because I've been so blinded by that temptation, that sin that I just may have just started with just a, a little, little bite over here. And then all of a sudden, I, I'm engulfed in it. Well, Thaolin was in Lord of the Rings. But what brought Thaolin out? It took Gandalf, the grain. 
who came to him and reminded him who he was, who said, you've been blinded by this. He needed to hear who he was as king of Rohan. And for us, we need to be reminded, and that's what this passage is doing. We need to be reminded of who we are in Christ. When you get engulfed by sin, when you get embattled by this war that is raging in your life, you need to be reminded of who you are in Christ. You've been buried with Him. You, you died with Him. The old self buried with Him and resurrected. You've been given new life in Christ. You are not defined by that old sin any longer. You are defined by your Christ, by your Jesus. You live for King Jesus. Three things. The first one is this. And, and this is a word of caution. I'm not saying to just let go and let God. That phrase is nonsense. I, I'll just say that. Paul many times tells us you must battle with your sins. You must deal with your sins. You must mortify, as John Owen said, you must mortify your sins. But as you do so, remember this. Remember who you are in Christ. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The guilt of sin should no longer hold you captive. You are not guilty because of the righteousness of Christ. You are not bound to live in that guilt any longer. Take the forgiveness that Jesus offers. Take a hold of it. Grasp it. Hold on to it. Because we know it doesn't mean that those who are, who are believers, those who are saved, will be, will be free completely from the temptations of sin. You and I both know that from a reality perspective. Sin will always try to regain mastery over your life. Sin will always try to reign. It will try to make you obey its lust. It will try to lead you down the hard, hard paths. It will do whatever it wants. It will say, there's no consequences. It will say, did God really say? The devil told me. It will tell you that life will be better if you embrace it. But we know we are not captive by it. We can say no. We can have victory. So in that moment when sin feels overwhelming in this life, run to Christ. Here's what he promises. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You will face temptations in this life, but God is faithful. And this whole passage hinges on that. God is faithful. And I will tell you, he will bring temptations, and as he does so, these temptations will be overwhelming. And truthfully, you can't handle them in your own abilities. You can't handle all these things. But what does it say? It says he will provide a way of escape that you may able, be able to endure. He won't take the temptation away. But what's it promise? You might endure it. You might be able to have victory through it. And these temptations that come into our lives, if we trust Christ, if we trust the Holy Spirit, if we run to him and hold on to these truths, we can't endure the sins and temptations of life and come out victorious. Because the truth is, we never have to sin. We never have to give in. We can trust Christ. Last point. Christians are now defined by grace. Verses 12 and 14. What not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions? Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Do not let sin 
be your master. The temptations will come. The battles will rage. But don't give in. Don't give in. Sin is tricky. Yeah, it always has been. It always will be. I, I once heard pastors say this. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. Keep you longer than you wanted to stay. It cost you more than you ever intended to pay. Sin has devastating consequences. So give yourself to be used by God. No, don't, don't say, well, I can play both sides here, right? I can do a little over here. I can do a little over there. No. Give yourself to God. Be used by God. Sin brings destruction. Godliness brings the blessings of God. Life under grace is not an invitation to sin. A life under grace is a life in Christ. It's a life committed to the fullness and the blessings and all the riches that God has given us. So what's our response? And should we use grace as an excuse to sin? Pray that we don't. I have two thoughts for us. One of my concerns, one of my concerns is that there are maybe people here, there may be people watching. There's others we come in contact to with every single week that have never experienced saving grace of God. And, and that's where it all starts. We, we all have this, what the Bible calls this common grace that we all experience. We've all been blessed in many ways by God that we just, we could never thank Him enough for those things. But He also, there, there's a special grace. There's a, there's a saving grace that many who have heard the truth, they know the truth, but for some reason they refuse to repent of their sins. They refuse to give their lives fully to God. You have to trust in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the gospel that we preach and teach and love as Christians. And in my challenge, I ask this question, like, what, what are we waiting for? If you've never done so, what, what are you waiting for? Because there's never going to be a special uh, moment. There's never going to be a special time. There's never going to be a special day. Well, I'll wait that to, uh, until that day. It's like I've been watching. I, I get involved in uh, all the college football recruiting and all those things. And people set these commitment dates on these special times. And I, I'm thinking this morning, I read something that was talking about, well, you can set that date. But guess what? You're not promised tomorrow. None of us are. We, we see that every single week. We are not promised tomorrow. So what are we waiting for? You know the truth. Believe the truth. Repent of your sins. Trust Christ with your life. Give yourself to Christ. Let's stop wasting our time. Let's stop messing around. Let's give ourselves to Christ. Sin is done with. Sin is a waste. Give your life to Christ. Believe in His gospel today. Come talk to me. Right, let's walk through it together. Let's, let's, let's discuss how this life in Christ looks. Because as I've said, as you see, there's ups and downs in the Christian life. And navigating it can be tricky. But it starts with the gospel. It starts with committing your sight to self, giving your life to Christ. Take that step first. And do it today. For the rest of us, let's use our freedom in Christ live free. Free from the power of sin. Free to use all His righteousness. Free to rest in the grace of God. Because Jesus has changed everything in your life. Jesus has changed everything in my life. I, I am a testament to that. What I once desired, I, I no longer do. What I once wanted, I no longer want. And yet, I find myself embattled in temptations with sins just like you do. And there's a war that rages. There's a battle that rages. But there's grace. There's God who's promised that I can have victory because Jesus has changed everything in my life. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for today. I am grateful for this passage that has been very challenging to my life, has been hitting me in some areas that I needed hit. And I pray this morning it is an encouragement to others that as they experience the temptations and the sins of life that are not unusual, that are common to us all. We read that no temptation is uncommon to man. They've been seen for generations. But by your help, by your strength, by your grace, sin no longer has dominion over us. We are defined by who we are in Jesus. And I pray that we will take hold of that grace, that we will take hold of that freedom, that love and faithfulness you have shown to us, that we will live Christian life as you intended. Lord, help us because it can be really, really, really hard. These battles, they rage against us and we find ourselves being torn one way and another and this, this internal battle, the mind that takes place and yet we know we can have victory in you. But I pray that as you told us to mortify our sins, I pray that we will persevere, not give up, keep going, keep pressing on, until one day, we, we don't have to deal with this any longer. We will be with you. But until that day, give us hope, give us encouragement, and it is only found in Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, please stand with me as we sing our closing song.